little younger uh, than the other two, is uh, certainly one of the leading experts in the country on the issues of uh, foreign policy uh, and the Constitution. I'd like to um, take up Jack's challenge uh, directly, which is to try to tell a historical story about uh, how uh, the powers of war may not be so, uh, I guess, so pro-congressional as he thinks. And I don't want to exclude Lou from this, because I think Lou has very much the same views as Jack does. But let me just say, uh, to start, that as you can tell from the debates uh, that we've had in the past and we're having now, is that there's a big gap between presidential practice and the views of academics. I think it's quite clear, I don't think anyone would dispute this at least since uh, the Korean War, if not earlier, uh, presidents have gone to war uh, without congressional permission. And, and Lou has done a lot of work exactly to trace out how different presidents have um, at times ignored Congress or refused uh, to seek congressional authorization for the wars they've been involved in. And so the uh, question that uh, got me started on this is whether Excuse I'm with the Institute of Governmental Studies where the organizer this conference. I'm going to ask you to please sit down, stop disrupting the conference so that other people Excuse hear what the panel said. Fire said. You. We hope you'll listen to life. Fire time. Excuse you. me. I'm more concerned about I'm talking. I'm with the Institute of Governmental Fire Studies. Please yeah. stop disrupting the conference. Yeah. Fire time. Yeah. Fire time. Fire time. Fire time. Fire time. Thank you. I hope everyone will listen politely and hear what the speakers have to say. Go ahead. Thanks. So the question, uh, at least in my mind, is there really such a large gap between uh, practice, at least for the last 60 years, and what people think uh, the framers intended? And it, it's an interesting uh, switch of positions because the people who are usually in favor of originalism also usually the ones in favor of more presidential power, people more critical, in this case, presidential power and lots of other, I'm not saying these are your personal views on these other issues, but usually are in favor of an evolving, uh, sometimes people call it living constitution. But in this area, I think people who are critical of the presidency and the executive branch make very strong claims about what the framing means. And I think you got the sense of it from Lou and Jack's position. They would say that those original views ought to bind our practice today. And, and, and so a lot of it has to do with how clear you think the message from the framing is. And my uh, arguments really don't go to uh, being able to say definitively that the president or Congress have the upper hand. My view is more that uh, the history is not so clear and that if anything, what the uh, framers would have anticipated would have been a more fluid political process. So I don't think that, for example, the Commander-in-Chief Clause or the Vesting Clause switches off Congress's Article 1, Section 8 powers. What I do think is that both branches have their constitutional powers, and they can use them to cooperate if they want to in matters of war, but they can also just as easily use them to try to frustrate and stop each other's uh, policies. I think that's really the lesson of some of the historical evidence. Please sit down so the people behind you can see Thank you very much. I have to say, I feel like one of the trees that used to so the stadium, um, but I don't want to get cut down quite yet. Um, so it seems to me that uh, so some of the evidence that Jack was talking about have to do with that. So you have, I think it's fair to say, the uh, 17th and really the 18th century struggle between the king and parliament over control of the war. And while it's true that Blackstone uh, provides a very formal description of the king's powers that are quite broad. I think in practice, I think as Jack Sevens shows, there's much more fluid uh, interaction between the crown and the parliament that goes well beyond what the formal powers say. So you have, for example, uh, the British parliament passing laws trying to end the, Revo the Revolutionary War, at least ending British participation to stop the Revolutionary War. You have Britain passing uh, the Mutiny Acts, and some of this comes to influence American understandings today. The Mutiny Act would certainly be constitutional today under the American system because the Congress has the power to write the past rules governing you know, forces. Uh, the Congressional law trying to end the war in uh, British North America, what they thought of as British North America, is if you think about it, the way uh, the Vietnam War ended. In the Vietnam War, 
Actually, I don't know if your example was really linked to funding, but you know, Congress ended the Vietnam War by cutting off all funds for any hostilities in Southeast Asia, and the, the President followed them, followed that law. It seems to me what you had coming out of the British experience was not just you could line up this list of powers on the King's side and this list of powers on the Parliament side, but you'd want to understand how did the framers think that those powers interacted into an operating political system. And I think, I think it's uh, fair to say that in that system, either the British king formally had the power to launch wars and make treaties on his own. In practice, Parliament had the upper hand because of its control over the funding and raising the armed forces, which is what the British revolutions in the 17th century were fought about. And I think my claim would be that the framers, when they wrote up their own uh, allocation of war powers, thought that that would primarily be uh, the same system that the British, um, that the British system of political political process that allowed for a large amount of conflict between the two branches would be the same kind of system we would expect uh, today. And so I don't think it would be a surprise to learn that immediately after uh, the Constitution under the Washington administration, there's already by Washington's second term a great deal of conflict over whether the president could articulate and enforce a neutrality, neutrality proclamation in the wars between Britain and France and already even by, uh, so by the 1790s you have Alexander Hamilton and James Madison who had once collaborated on the Federalist Papers arguing quite vociferously about whether the executive power of the vesting clause and then commander in chief power allowed the president to say we weren't going to go to war on the side of France, whether that was for Congress to decide. So, one quite big is if it's so, uh, it doesn't seem so obvious and clear to me as if within the first 10 years of the ratification of the Constitution, you have some of uh, the leading thinkers who wrote the Constitution already fighting about uh, its meaning. The other thing I would say is it seems to me that one uh, corollary to that point is that Congress, if you look at the list of authorities, uh, Congress has a great deal of power to stop wars before they begin, to end wars once they've started. Even in the era of modern warfare, modern warfare is so expensive that no president can really wage a war of any significance without uh, appropriations bills. Even the war in Kosovo, which was a, an air war with no ground troops of a limited duration, uh, President Clinton had to go to Congress at the beginning of hostilities to seek uh, funding, which barely passed. And at the same time, Congress, by the way, refused to declare war and tied, so did not pass an authorization approving the war. But Congress has a lot of other powers available too, and even if after the fact, as when say Congress might get tricked into approving more by the executive branch, it has the power of impeachment, which I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know what uh, Jacqueline thinks about this, but my sense is that the framers thought impeachment would be more widely used than we in fact uh, use it. It was a fairly common tool to remove the uh, British ministers who just ran bad wars. It wasn't something about committing criminal acts. If you had lost the war, you could get impeached. 